Welcome to the Mr. Beacon podcast. We're in Orlando in Florida. I'm speaking to Nathan Dunn, who is the co-founder and CEO of Blue Cats. Nathan, thanks so much for making time to talk with us. No problem. Thanks for, uh, great to meet you in person and thanks for uh, inviting me on the show. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really pumped because, uh, you know, we we've really have a broad set of guests, broad set of topics, but you're right at the core of, you are one of the original pioneers in the Bluetooth beacon space with, uh, with the Blue Cats products and this kind of iconic shape and design. I remember yeah, looking at the first, when, when I was getting involved in this like six years ago, you guys already had product out yep. and you had great reviews. And so you've seen the progression of this industry. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that story, sure. what your journey's been like and what you've, the lessons that you've learned and where you've ended up. Um, sure. So let's let's introduce the company briefly for people that who don't know Blue Cats. Sure. Um, yeah, Blue Cats uh, was started. Um, really, we started with an ultra wideband um, product, uh, which is the plus location system side of our business, huh. uh, and that was started in 2009. Uh, and it, the focus then was retail. Uh, we we wanted to track how people shopped, or just create a, a more granular database on really how people shop because the most advanced retailers on the planet at the time and still today know everything about you as soon as you've checked out. It's all about purchase data, but the amount of money spent on laying out stores and what have you in marketing, there's no real definitive database on how you actually made that purchase decision. Mm -hmm. And so our curiosity led us to uh, reach out and try and find tracking technology. That led us to a company in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, which originally called Time Domain and we started using their, their technology. And then a couple of years after that, in early 2011, uh, we purchased that, that business. And so that gave us our first um, engineering footprint in the US. And from the, the, the value that we could see in that real-time uh, visibility of who's doing what within retail, um, we, we, we then branched out. The iPhone had, had grown since its launch in, in 07 to a point where everyone had enough firepower and computing power in their pocket that that became an option um, to, to try and use for better location. And so the concept of a beacon, a uh, Bluetooth beacon, which we, we just by default we started calling beacons mm -hmm. uh, back then, uh, an SDK within any app and then a, a cloud platform to manage that. And this was before iBeacon became a thing? It, it, it was about uh, 14 months before iBeacon was ever a thing. And so it's amazing the power of Apple for 14 months was a grind, convincing people that yes, this is possible. Yes, one of these can last potentially up to seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and you know, there is a cloud platform to be able to manage a lot of the rules and events. Um, and because the, 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 the market was really fixated on the old school mentality that Bluetooth is such a, a power hungry um, you know, um, you know, protocol. And you know, BLE, as we know, uh, has really enabled um, low-power uh, devices to, to thrive uh, and beacon. So, for that for that first period, it was just a, a, a trying to convince people that this was this was technically possible. And then Apple slaps an eye in front of Beacon, and everyone's an expert overnight. Um, so but you'd already gone into this whole retail space with ultra wideband. Yep. That, that came first. Yeah, exactly. So that that, that gave us. Um, that's when the light bulb uh, went off with us to be able to say um, there is value in in uh, real time location, effectively. And it happened to be in retail, but the reality was that we realised that there's um, that, that there was a range of uh, industries. Uh, that, that could, could derive value from real-time location. And some of those applications don't need to be hyper-accurate, uh, centimetre-level accuracy uh, that mm -hmm. you can achieve with UWB. And so that's when the, the near enough is good enough uh, mentality led us to look at, OK, well, let's focus on ease of deployment and, and more importantly, ease of management. Um, so an, a number of companies that we've spoken to over the years, it's very easy to walk into a meeting and um, wow people with a demonstration but take those devices and deploy 15,000 of them across 3,000 outlets across the entire nation, uh, that's a completely different proposition. And, and, and those challenges around scalability, that's what we focused on from day one with a lot of the, lot of the tools that we created. Well, that's really good because a lot of the Bluetooth Beacon players, they essentially had one product and they kind of lived or died by the strengths and weaknesses of Bluetooth. But you have two completely different approaches to solving a similar set of problems. And if people want 
are willing to sign up to the infrastructure of ultra wideband and want, really need the precision, you can do that. But if they want the kind of the light, uh, low investment that comes with Bluetooth, you can do that you, as you, well. Absolutely, and that's that, that's our proposition to the market today. Is um, we, we, we've got the one platform that can run 100% locally, or 100% um, in the cloud, or a combination of the two. And the discussion with most um, businesses and most verticals starts with the granularity and the real-time nature of events. Um, how, how granular do you need it to be? Is it a safety application? If something happens, do you need something else to be triggered immediately locally? Yeah. Or is it just a nice to have at the end of the week, end of the year, end of the month, run a report and, we, and, and, and you've got visibility to what's going on within a certain space? And, and we can fill, that, um, fill out a solution and satisfy needs anywhere within that but also more importantly is you can start with the light touch and it, it's very simple to, to, to add um, additional features as and when um, the use case arises and, and the companies become um, you know, more willing to, you know, to embrace the technology. And is it the same um, software backend behind both systems or are they different? It, it is, so, so that was, um, the you know, Blue Cats and Plus were on a, were on a, on a different trajectory um, early on, uh, given the, the, the mobile engagement focus of retail. Mm -hmm. um, and that really uh, dropped off significantly, um, probably 2015 or thereabouts. And uh, I put that down to the initial interest in, in Beacons were the early adopter developers and IT divisions of um, a lot of retailers and a lot of organisations in general. And that initial inquiry enthusiasm was about understanding how this works. And once they've figured out, okay, this is how it works, this is how we can integrate an SDK, this is how we can manage events and, and, and manage communication, then that toolkit was handed over to the marketers and no fault of the marketers, but they'd never had this power before. You know, they'd never had the ability to say, the next 100 people that stand in this location because they've come from that direction, we're gonna say this. And so that was the, the next two, three year lull where a lot of, um, I suppose commentators um, took a lot of a lot of a lot of pride in saying beacons are dead or beacons were a fad. In actual fact, it's just the the, the organisations that uh, beacons are relevant for. Um, you, you can't mess this stuff up. Um, one, one, once you go, there's no reverse. And so, quite rightly, they had to get their communication strategy in line with the newfound uh, power that they had um, with with you know, with with customers. So who are the companies that have made it across that chasm that it takes some time to cross? Well, it's, I mean, there's a lot of retail uh, mm -hmm. that we're all going to make as famous um, six, seven years ago um, are now, now coming back. And a, a, a couple of things um, are, are different. Um, firstly, I mean, a lot of them ask whether we have an NDA and we, we can point to one we signed seven years ago, but um, uh, generally it's a completely different team that we're talking to. Yeah. Um, but there's, a, there's certainly a degree of maturity on our side because we know what we don't know um, mm -hmm. and we've got the scars to be able to re really really set the tone for any engagement. And um, I think the, the, a lot of retailers are coming as well, understanding, okay, there was some discovery, there were some trials. We understand the limitations as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the key where we've seen success is we start with here's when it won't work and here's when you're at the whim of uh, yeah. Google and Apple. Yeah. And it is what it is. And if you can't get your head around that, we, we're wasting both, both our time. Yeah. Whereas previously, was everyone was bedazzled by the size of the retailer that you were talking to yeah. and thinking, here we go. Yeah. Um, now there's real, um, there's, there's a real foundational understanding that, okay, this, there's a legitimate time and a place for this technology. And um, you know, thankfully, we've been able to, to stay the course. So when they, they do do their research, they can see that we've got the scars to, to, to guide them in the right direction. So who are your customers? Um, we've got a range of industries. A lot of customers we can't really uh, talk about. Right. Um, but we, we've identified four key verticals that we, we want to go after. And some of the, within those verticals, there's a, a, either a range of integrators or going direct. Um, those verticals are sport, um, in, industrial, which can really be broken into um, warehousing, and uh, outdoor asset tracking. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the final vertical is hospitality. Um, now, it's, it, it's a very widespread from tracking college football players to making sure meals are delivered hot. Yeah. Um, but the great thing about um, our, our core offering and, 
bringing the two technologies together so that we've got the one core location engine um, that, that's come from PLUS, uh, from the UWB side of the business. Um, we've now positioned it so that we can ingest uh, not only our, our, our Bluetooth, but other location um, companies and technologies, mm -hmm. um, other ultra-wideband as well as ours. And it's really around providing a service that can, that, that, that can pick up the location and then um, provide a solution that makes it usable and can integrate um, with your business. So an example of that is um, you know, tracking uh, subcontractors uh, for, for either safety reasons or just auditing the fact that um, they're, they're, there's presence there mm -hmm. on a construction site mm -hmm. is, is technically in the architecture in that is exactly the same as uh, someone has a table flag with our, our tag in it and the order's ready, someone punches in uh, tag 156 and it, it shows them on a map. Uh, it's exactly the same underlying technology and so that allows us to focus on that, that core product and as far as the window dressing of the UI and where it's deployed, uh, allows us to, to, to spread across those verticals. So where would you say the sweet spot is? Where are you seeing more ultra wideband? And where would you say, where are you seeing the biggest value, the biggest economic growth for the Bluetooth side of the business? Sure, um, ultra wideband is relevant uh, on, in, in, in two scenarios. One is the, uh, the hyper accurate uh, location in absolute real time. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, nothing comes close to a properly deployed UWB system. There's no doubt about that. Um, it, it has the price tag uh, that, that, that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. um, now the price is, is significantly um, you know, cheaper than it was three years ago and it's continuing to, to head in that direction. Um, but the, yeah, the value proposition around UWB is either that, that granularity is needed um, and, and that, that may be due to a safety application um, it may just be due to such a, such a challenging RF environment um, that you know, anything in 2.4 um, is, is just not going to work. Right. Or you can't rely on it. So, so what, what would be kind of like the classic industry example of where they need all of those things versus Bluetooth? Well, I mean, we, 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 we've done um, you know, uh, American football uh, trials and we've got, mm -hmm. a, we've got a, 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 a player tracking uh, product that's rolling out in college football. Oh, right. um, and uh, we, we're doing that with a, with a joint venture partner um, up in North Carolina. And in that instance, um, the, the, the distances in terms of where the, um, you know, where the readers can be positioned relative to the, to the players, um, a, a packed 90,000 seat uh, stadium with 300 Wi-Fi access points, everyone updating Instagram, uh, roving cameras on the sidelines, it's a pretty challenging RF environment. Sorry. And so a lot of player tracking uh, systems at the moment is all about registering what the player's done and then download it after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, we can actually um, uh, thrive in that environment. And so the packet we can get off the player uh, is not only being used to locate where that player is in real time, we can also use that packet as a back channel for other sensor data that we can get off the player. So all of a sudden you've got, you've got real time granularity on, on what's going on that can be used um, you know, post event to, to slice and dice. And, and, and the same goes for um, manufacturing facilities. Um, just um, RF uh, challenging environments where there's a lot of multi-path mm -hmm. uh, due to blockages and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, Ultra wideband gives you the ability to uh, try and aug augment some of that and then any rules and events uh, are, are then done with software once you've got that, that, that coverage. And the converse on Bluetooth, uh, where scalability, you've got less hazardous sure. environments. Yeah, and, and, and look, Bluetooth uh, really starts with, as, as I mentioned previously, near enough is good enough from, a, from an accuracy standpoint. Yeah. And so we do have, a, um, a, as I said, leveraging the UWB location engine, uh, we're achieving um, quite good 2D tracking uh, using Bluetooth as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the flexibility of, of Bluetooth allows you to have outlying uh, zones and gates and, and check-in areas where you just need to know that uh, a particular asset has moved through a choke point. Right, um, basic where, presence. Yeah, and, and look, we're, we're integrating GPS as well. So um, we've, we've got a product where we can integrate, um, we can have our, our edge relay our Bluetooth scanner um, on a drone that has GPS and so you're able to um, basically get snapshots of what assets are out in the field at any given time. And, and it's, all, it's, all, it. it's all managed via the one platform, which is, which is good. 
it's killing me. We've got to wrap this up. I could talk to you for another hour, easy. Um, but I just want to ask you, what are you doing at RFID Journal Live? It's like, this is Bluetooth. It, it is. Well, the, the amazing transformation we've seen over the last three years. Um, you know, three years ago, uh, we, we, we didn't exhibit, but we attended. And or we'd, we'd been attending previously as well. And it, it, there wasn't a lot of um, RTLS. Um, certainly on a lot of the signage, I, I don't think you could find RTLS anywhere. And when we'd speak to people and say we're, we're an RTLS company and no one really knew what that was. Mm -hmm. um, last year, we, we had a lot of success here, um, made a lot of, um, a lot of really exciting um, uh, contacts and uh, we're pursuing a lot of opportunities that we got from there. And I think the interest last year in us was we were demonstrating uh, our technology, which is unique at a trade show for some location companies. Mm -hmm. And um, we we're all about real-time location. This year you walk around and I've seen probably 10, uh, 10 booths that have RTLS uh, printed on them. So I think the, the, the timing is right. The market is, is, is arriving at, okay, we, we get the value in RTLS. Um, and we're well positioned because, as I like to say, we, we've never jumped on a bandwagon. Um, our, our, our core UWB team were part of the original team that invented ultra-wideband back in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. And we were the, one of the first in the world to, to, to come up with beacons. So we've never jumped on a bandwagon and then tried to make it up by, by watching other people. Um, we've just got some very, very smart people and we give them the bandwidth to, if, they, if, if, if their gut feel leads them in a particular direction with a little bit of a, um, you know, due diligence, we, we head, head that way, so it's, Wonderful. Uh, it's a good time. Nathan, it's been just great Thanks, talking Steve. to you. Thanks very much for making the time. No worries, thank you. All right. Cheers. I ask all our guests what three songs they would take if they were, for some inexplicable reason, on a trip to Mars, and for another inexplicable reason, they could only have three songs. Right. So, and, have you and, thought about what three how many songs people have chosen Starman since uh, the recent SpaceX launch? Actually, nobody. Right. Well, I'm not going to. It's a bit cliche. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, I, I was forewarned, and I have seen seen the seen the uh, the interviews previously. So, all right. Um, three Excellent. songs for me. One would be Rain Song by Zeppelin. Oh, nice. Um, just just an epic song uh, that I, I've obviously grown up with, uh, uh -huh. and um, next one. I think would be, which is probably, um, I can relate to the journey that we've been on as a company, would be Long Time Running by Tragically Hip, All right. uh, iconic uh, Canadian band. Uh -huh. And the third one... Uh, and any reason for that? Um, well, I mean, we're at, at, at Blue Cats, we're um, you know, on the verge of being a nine year overnight success. Um, and I think you know, certainly that song is all about um, you know, there's no short-term wins, and even a even a um, even a failure uh, is a stepping stone to um, to really getting what you want. Mm -hmm. So, I think that that certainly resonates with our journey. Yeah. And the last one, I think, would be um, uh, Die Straits Brothers in Arms. Classic. Absolutely. And, Very uh, good. You know, if we talk about that a little bit more, yeah. I might get emotional. I might need a hug, Steve. So we should move on. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but it's got some significance for you. Oh, again, it's it's, you know, it's similar to, to the first choice. It's it's just an iconic song, and yeah. um, I mean, yeah, you can you can find hidden meaning in there. Um, the whole sort of um, our one world, but now we live in different ones and all the rest of it. Very good. Well, yeah. great choices. Thanks a lot. No worries. <laughs>